The Ute Pass Historical Society is proud to introduce Ann Cusack Johnson, who will share with you her memories of early Ute Pass. Cascade was built by Kansas Baptist people around the time that the railroad was being built and formed a little community there. They had a little Baptist church. It now is the red building that's right on the way up to the school on the right. And I remember going up there when I was a little girl to some Christmas party one time and having a lot of fun. We, Cascade seemed that those, in those days quite a ways away from our home because it, walking up there, although we went to school there and walked to school, but it was a, a quite a ways uphill, a way uphill at the time. But there were people that were friendly and dear in between. Mrs. Johnson is the daughter of Thomas Cusack, the Chicago Billboard King, who first came to the Ute Pass area in 1895. When he bought this place, you see, he got out and walked around it. And when Mother and he were out here in 1895, going up to Cascade to visit somebody who had been in Congress with him. And it said for sale. And Mother thought it was beautiful in the middle of the day, but when they came back down the path that night, and coyotes were howling on each side of the valley. Oh, and Papa said, this would be a wonderful place to raise children. She thought, oh, I hope he forgets about it. Augusta Cow, she was a poetess. When they got there, sure enough, Papa hired a buggy to go out to the orange grove where the Cowses lived. And Mrs. Cowes was up in her cottage crying when her husband was selling it. Mother was out in the carriage crying because her husband was buying it. And when she'd tell that story, she'd say, but what would we have done without Colorado? You see, he bought it in the fall. They were married in July 10th, 1895. And in the fall, they came out here on their way to San Diego. And that's when he agreed to buy the place. But they didn't move out till the following May. I was three weeks old when they came, or June, rather. That would have been 1896. But they had bought the place already. 13 acres at the start, the old house. That was a very small house, about three or four rooms when the Cousins lived there. And then it was added to Mr. Gillis, the man that built the Montcalm Castle. He was the one that came up and added additions to that little old frame house. So that it expanded as we, we grew more, nu more numerous. And that's where we lived until after mother died then this was built. The annual spring pilgrimage of the Cusack family from Chicago to Cascade brought them through Manitou Springs. They often stayed over at the Montcalm Castle, present home of the Manitou Springs Historical Society, while waiting for the weather to break and the road to be cleared. But we used to stay there before we came up here. It would be too cold up here, and we'd stay at the Montcalm. And my brother and I climbed all over the walls there and built snowmen and had a wonderful time. But when we came time to come home, we were glad to come back up here, though. It was, well, I was quite young, fourth or fifth grade, I guess, or third grade. And some friend of mine that I met at the Montcalm asked me to go to school there with her. And the teacher asked me to come. But when I got there, the teacher said to all the children, and this is the little girl that lives way up in those mountains. In those days, Cascade was like Alaska is to us almost. And the little old winding road was considered quite hazardous, you know. Everybody looked at me as if I was some sort of a headhunter. I was so embarrassed. And the next day I went, I thought, well, I hope they forget about that so I can be just one of them. But they all looked at me and the teacher said, what's it like up there in the mountains? Well, I felt like an exhibit A, you know. And I said to Mother, I don't like to go to school there. I like my little Cascade school better. But anyway, pretty soon we came up the pass, and we'd go down in a runabout or a carriage, and the horse would be put in a stable down there. So when the time came for us to leave, everybody on the Montcalm the castle there were out in the front, and they were saying to my mother, you couldn't go up that pass on this evening. Oh, I'm not a bit afraid, said my mother. And, but... We got in this little runabout carriage with one seat and a frisky horse, and we started up the pass. And we thought Mother was so brave. I remember staying so close to her because 
there was lightning and the storm was getting bad and the road was so narrow that when when the lightning would flash we hardly knew whether we were on it or not you know it would be so dark in between and when we got up here I never was so glad to get to any place I thought I never want to go away again but the little Cascade school was so homelike and so nice the Manitou school seemed so big and so kind of forbidding and Miss Pitzer was the one that we had she was a sister-in-law of Champ Clark's he was speaker of the house then in Washington. She was a very well-educated, charming person, and she had a daughter who had tuberculosis. That's why she was out here, and they stayed at the East Home then. The East Home was as long as I can remember, so I don't know when it was built, but Miss Pitzer was a wonderful person. She knew her history, and she knew all about rocks, and when we had to study any kind of geology or any kind of anything that had to do with trees or flowers or plant life. We'd go outdoors and sit on the mountainside and study it, which I thought was wonderful. We always had some religion in the beginning. We had the 23rd Psalm. We had the uh, Our Father. We sang all kinds of songs that were come bringing in the sheaves. And one little killing song that I was a children just was Jesus Wants Me for a Sunbeam. I got to know more songs there than any of my Protestant friends knew. But anyway, we loved it. There was a little wheezy organ, and she would play it, and we'd all sing, you know. There were only seven of us there one winter, one year, and another time there were maybe as many as ten all different grades. And we'd have spell downs, and our dogs would come in. If anybody opened the door to go out to get coal for the little potbelly stove, or if they went out to go to the lavatory. A dog always got his way in when they came back. The teacher rather gave up on that. But we always came home for lunch, even in those days, and walked back again. Once or twice we had burros or horses. And then there was a, one of the Wellingtons up that way, up at Wellington Gulch, who always came on a horse. She was much older than I. But I thought, if Mother would only let me take a horse all the time. The Colorado Midland Railroad, built in 1887, filled the everyday travel needs of Ute Pass. The early development of this area was dependent upon this mode of transportation. Once a week, we get a big lot of groceries here. So I was sent down on the morning train, which left Cascade about 9. But I would be given a long list. And I would go to a grocery store in Colorado Springs called Burgess's. It was a very fancy one. That, and they were always good to me. All I had to do was bring, give it to a certain man. And then I would be given enough money to get something that I wanted myself. And if it was a very hot day in Colorado Springs, and we weren't used to that heat, you know, up here, usually ice cream seemed like the most delectable thing. So I would get ice cream. And my brother, I think, said, how about getting some chocolate sauce? So I got a bottle of that, too, and the ice cream. And when I'd get up on the noon train, which was a sweltering thing to take, because it, if the sun was beating down in the middle of a summer day and the smoke would fill all the trestles on the way up and come right through the train like a dust storm, only worse because it would be black. Then when we get to Cascade, oh, that I'd look forward to that ice cream. Well, one day it was particularly hot. I got off at the station in Cascade, and the man was there, but we had so many groceries, I said I'd walk home. So I came back down the old dusty road in the heat, carrying my ice cream in one hand and probably a purse or something in the other. And I wondered why all of a sudden it was so light in that one hand, you know, so easy to... And I looked down, and there was a trail of ice cream all the way. Oh, well, I was just thinking my brothers were waiting for me, and oh, I said, look what happened, and we could have just cried, but I said, I still have the chocolate sauce. So everybody came in and had the children, you know, and they all, we all had a teaspoon of chocolate sauce every once in a while. It was in a big bottle, and so that was a weird experience, but I learned about ice cream from that. So we didn't have ice all the time, but we had springs. And the spring ran through a trough, and we keep the milk sometimes in that trough, icy cold water. But and then we made cottage cheese and butter, and uh, buttermilk, 
Nobody likes buttermilk now, but uh, we thought it was wonderful. <laughs> we had very simple good days. We had currant bushes and gooseberry bushes. We'd have currant pie and gooseberry pie. That I didn't like, but the currant pie was good. Currant jelly, rather. Choke cherry jelly. The Cusack family, up to this time, spent their summers in a modest home near the stone wall called Eleanor Cottage. In 1920, Thomas Cusack purchased the Cascade Town Company with the intention of replacing the dilapidated Ramona and Cascade House hotels with modern structures. His desire was to offer a retreat for his employees where they might enjoy their holidays in an atmosphere quite different from the busy life of Chicago. He also dreamed of a permanent home in the mountains to be called Mary Green Pines as a tribute to his wife, Mary Green. Uh, Papa wanted to build a house. Of course, everybody was building big, spectacular houses, uh, Glen Ary and different places, you know. But Mother talked him out of it because she felt that the best thing, she knew he wanted his children near him, but she thought for everybody to have their own log cabin would be the idea place and then have a meeting place where they could celebrate and have get-togethers, you know. But after she died in 1922, he was so lonely that my brothers urged him to go ahead. He had the plans already made, and so he did. This picture of him was taken on the day of the formal going into the big house. That was, well, we went into the big house in 1923. It was started in 1922 to be built, and it was a wonderful winter, so the workmen didn't lose one day of work. And we went in in the spring, and there were 26 people counting guests, and the help lived in the other house. However, Charlie Thomas was out here at the time, and he was a very fine builder, too. He had built the Episcopal Church, and he also, later on, after my father died, designed the chapel of Cascade, which was his favorite place. He was a very devout Episcopalian. So Charlie Thomas also had charge of the carrying out all the plans or changing them when necessary in the big house. He always wanted a fireproof house. He, in those days, you know, they were very much afraid of fires. Hotels burned in various parts of the country and and that was just a frame house. He was afraid of that, you see. The walls are two feet thick and the cement and everything. Of course, everything does dry out out there. It has steel frame and it's supposed to be fireproof. But the architect was a friend of my father's, Ralph Zimmerman, who did his office in Chicago and other things. Papa knew what kind of a house he wanted. He was very artistic himself. He wanted an Italian house because he liked the cheerful dining room. Mother liked the English houses, but the dining rooms were always paneled, and he thought gloomy. He wanted sunshine in the dining room and uh, a lot of windows. Didn't want draperies or anything in the beginning, but he finally conceded and, and had them put in because he thought the view was too beautiful. Ceiling. That's an Italian ceiling. We used to tease him about it. We'd say that with little cauliflowers up there, but Many of the houses in Italy have that kind of a ceiling. And I suppose it is a good ceiling for, in those days they didn't have, you know, any kind of soundproofing. This has never been repainted since it was built in 1922. It's been washed, but never repainted. My father knew paint very well, and he could have been an artist if he hadn't been poor and had to work, you know, young, rather young. But because he knew color, he could remember exactly when, when he bought the, this or any kind of a piece of furniture or a rug in New York, he knew what color would go. I can't retain that too well. You know, I might guess at it, but I wouldn't be as sure as he was. So this was painted on canvas in the first, and that's why it probably lasted a little longer than the parts of the house where it was painted on the plaster directly. The uh, ornamental plaster was done in New York and brought here. The mantles came from Rome. This was in Moffat's, this clock was in Moffat's home outside Denver. 
And the lady, though, the lady's head was on that mantle when it came. But Tom said she spoiled our party, so he had her put up on top of the clock. And she looks as if she belongs there. In 1978, the Marigreen Pines property was turned over to the Indiana province of the Congregation of Holy Cross to be used as a novitiate, where men spend a year of preparation for religious life. They're changing the porch now into a chapel, and they've done a beautiful job of it. That's the east entrance to the porch. What are those faces now? Trouble with people my age. You lose a word, and you don't remember it till 2 in the morning. And then it's too late to call up and remedy it. I'll think of it soon. I don't remember it now. But those vases were very beautiful. A very wonderful room for good times and hospitality. Although we did have some Democrat and Republican arguments around that table, especially when Roosevelt was running. <laughs> they were washing the wall in the dining room, and this Italian mantelpiece that showed Aurora, goddess of the dawn, you know, driving her. It, it was in the, in the marble. And of course, the marble, in order to have relief from the sameness, had a dark brown background, like the one in the living room. But these men thought, why, that mat's just dirt. And they washed, scrubbed and scrubbed. And Helen and I were gone about a, an hour, and we came back. <gasps> We couldn't ever put it back exactly the way it was, but I guess it was natural to do. Uh, oh, that's the one in the dining room. Looks like a birthday cake. Yes, it does. The marble came out of a bank in Chicago, the Illinois Merchants Bank, which was my father's bank for many years. And when the Zeppelin fell on it, they, uh, they wanted to build a new building after that. They had to almost because it destroyed some part of it. But they offered the marble to, to him for the house. Oh, the rug came from a home in, in France, and it was a, a single rug then. So you can imagine how enormous the ballroom was or whatever it was they had, they had it in. And uh, my father had it cut and fitted to each room, the living room, hall, dining room, and front porch. That was Dardanella, and we called her Dardanella. One of the reasons we had some things that were kind of peculiar, but also kind of uh, interesting, was because in order to get a couple of things he wanted, he had to buy the whole affair from some house that was being sold. But we called her Dardanella. That was a song at that time. She was supposed to be a, at the beginning of where people put their cards when they came to call my father's picture. Well, I never liked it. Evelyn and I didn't either because he looked so serious there. But uh, the man that did it was one of his artists that he had employed for years. He went, up, went to Spain and became a well-known portrait painter. When I first saw it, he could tell I was disappointed, you know, and he said to me, but I said, he doesn't have any sense of humor. I wish you'd been here, he said. Each one of my father's employees gave a dollar toward that to give him when he'd been 50 years without a strike in business, you know. Well, anyway, but they'd come in and they'd say, make him look more serious, make him look. And the artist said to me, I was distracted. I never remember him being without a sense of humor. Well, that was a picture that was taken, I think, on their wedding trip, or shortly around that time. She didn't like it because she thought it was too posy, but too much of a pose. In those days, you were supposed to, you were told to look very severe when you were having pictures taken keep serious. And nobody has thought of having a picture taken while laughing. But this was a gift to my mother and father, a wedding gift. And it's a solid mahogany secretary, empire style ampere, with marble secret drawers and ones that are not so secret. When you open the marble drawers, there's often a, a hidden secret drawer to the back of that drawer. This uh, came out of an Anglo-Saxon uh, chapel in England during the Depression when they were so anxious to make some money on the antiques that they have. And it's carved wood and beautifully carved of St. Margaret of Scotland, who was Queen of Scotland. Her husband was Malcolm, 
king of Scotland at the time. She was very good to the poor, very well thought of. Most of the furnishings are gone, but the rooms still hold the memories of the good times and pleasant years enjoyed by the Cusack family in their Colorado mountain home. Cascade always seemed to me to be dear and home-like. I was sent around one time on horseback to invite everybody to a celebration, and I was surprised to find little houses tucked under trees that I didn't even know existed in those faraway places, you know. That was before there was much development over on the right-hand side. I think it was uh, the uh, party was to be at the Ramona Hotel before it was torn down. I'm sure of that now. But I found people, interesting people in those faraway places, and we were also glad to know each other. We became very good friends, and, and after having been known of each other a little bit, but not being too close in the old days when the separations were too difficult to undo, you know. We used to walk up there for the mail. Everybody visited in the post office. Gossip went on in the post office. Mrs. Wellington, I know, one time, when, without knowing that one of us was there, was speaking very critically of the fact that I could wear jodhpurs in a house that had marble floors which she thought was positively scandalous. <laughs> the Cusack years left their mark on the little mountain community, as evidenced by the chapel overlooking the Ramona Hotel site and the community building, which replaced the Cascade House and is now Bob Young's Cabaret. But more importantly, Cascade left its mark on the Cusack family, and the fond memories can never be erased by time or space. Oh, I love, you can get too attached to a place in life. I've, just, I've discovered after seeing many people die, many changes happen. You can't get too attached to anything in this world, especially to the detriment of anybody else. I couldn't see where we could leave a, the place uh, to a huge family, all of whom loved it. No one could, family could afford to keep it up alone. And, uh, and I'm not so sure it's a good place to raise children in, you know. I know I remember a very wise woman said to me one time, never live in a house that's better than your neighbors. I, I think right now, the raise, the, it, it answered a purpose because it was, I think my father's intention was to have ch children love each other and get along together. And here we had families that were very different. They weren't the same nationalities, they weren't even the same religion. And, uh, but they got along well when they spent, spent their summers there, and that was good. But and now here we were a family of hundreds now, uh, not just uh, a small fa the families we were in the beginning. And I'm not so sure they would have gotten so well, along so well if they weren't big families. They loved each other, they know where. I came in there one night when Christy Cusack from Texas was sitting and weeping in the living room, and she said, oh, I love this place, Aunt Anne. Not because it's beautiful, because it's where all of us got to know each other. If she said otherwise, I would have thought just Texas was important. <laughs> well, anyway, but I, it answered a purpose. I don't think we should regret it. <laughs>